Good afternoon. I'm happy to be with you this afternoon for a few minutes. I do wish it could be more than virtual. My name is Mark Trexler. I'm Director of Climate Risk with DNV and DNV Kima Energy and Sustainability. What I'm going to be talking about today is, is just a, a, a sl small introduction to the subject of climate change and, and shipping. So first of all, you know, I, tend, I like to think about things from a, from a risk standpoint, and risk being a function of, of a hazard times exposure times vulnerability. And it's a useful frame for, for just keeping in mind all the things we're talking about in terms of climate change impacts, in terms of adaptation. In thinking about climate change and the hazard of climate change, one thing that's important to remember is that is that while we've talked a lot about sort of the two degree centigrade global mitigation target, particularly at political levels, we're now sort of past that point. It, it, it is increasingly unlikely, and in fact it's very unlikely, that we could actually stop global change at two degrees. Uh, and, and this is an interesting graphic that sort of shows what the, the worst case today is for the 2100. Uh, if we if we fail on the mitigation side and if the climate is more sensitive to climate change than we might have hoped, we could potentially be looking at six to eight degrees centigrade by the end of this uh, century, which which is sort of hard to imagine, frankly, um, and radically different from the two degrees mitigation target that we have been shooting for. And that in this graphic is really illustrated as the the best case regime at this point in terms of successful mitigation policies, which it is, it is hard to point to, and in terms of a low climate sensitivity, which is also hard to point to. And one of the really interesting indicators of sort of the sensitivity of climate is the whole issue of Arctic ice. And, and as you know, this year, we smashed all the records. This year was was uh, was a new record, uh, not quite showing up in this graphic, but was a new record for the minimum uh, extent of ice uh, existing uh, at at during the summer. And uh, who knows what will happen next year? But we are now talking about the possibility of of an ice free Arctic within the next decade. Uh, just just 10, 15 years ago, we were talking about an ice-free Arctic potentially by 2060, 2070, 2080. The bottom line that, that I'd like to leave you with, and, and sort of including the concept of, of black swans in this whole space, is that, is that climate change is a game changer for many industries, including the shipping industry. And so is climate change policy. I mean, from, the, from ships float, obviously, uh, but you know, climate change for ports could be a real game changer for thousands of ports around the world that are, that are not anticipating and will not be prepared for um, more accelerated sea level rise. And so you know, whether sooner or later, we're looking both at climate change itself and at climate change policy as variables that will dramatically affect uh, the way that we do business around the world, uh, including, I think, in the maritime sector. So what is the role of maritime in sort of climate change and greenhouse gas emissions? Well, this graphic just, just provides a basic summary. Uh, emissions have been rising rapidly in the last several decades, as shown in the top right there. Today, shipping produces about a billion tons of carbon dioxide, about 3% of the global total. Uh, seems like a small number, but when you get into carbon dioxide and sort of individual sources, most things are relatively small numbers. Shipping is already equivalent to the sixth largest country of the, in the world in terms of, of carbon dioxide emissions. And the real issue for shipping as well as for aviation is that uh, the the growth is rapid, the forward-looking growth is rapid. And so when you look at some of the forecasts down below, different IPCC uh, forecasts of CO2 emissions from ships, you, they, they range pretty widely from, from a, a completely stable, at, at today's level, sort of one gigaton, up to the possibility under, under some pretty extreme scenarios of seven gigatons by the end by 2050. 
So that's that's where the concern is here, because if if everybody is reducing CO2 emissions in the electric generation sector, in the transport sector, uh, the land-based transport sector, and uh, shipping emissions are growing year on year by by a number of percentage points per year, it it starts to become inconsistent. You can't you can't continue a downward ramp on global emissions while shipping and aviation emissions are continuing a steep upward ramp. Let's put those numbers just into context for a second. Uh, you know, Pre-industrial concentrations of carbon dioxide, 278 parts per million. As of this year, we've hit 400 parts per million in, in some parts of the world. Uh, where, where do we need to be? Well, sort of depends on, on, on where, how safe do you want to play it. The interesting number from, from sort of an ocean's perspective, about the 350 parts per million that, that a lot of marine scientists are advocating, is the sense that that would, would, is the safe zone when it comes to ocean acidification, comes to corals, things like that. And when you get to 450, 550, 650, you're going to witness dramatic changes in those marine ecosystems over the coming uh, decades. But what's important to realize is, is, is if we did want to stabilize concentrations today, let's say at 400 parts per million, we would have to reduce uh, global emissions instantaneously by more than 70% just to stabilize concentrations, not to go back to 350, but just to stabilize concentrations. We're talking about, about a, a, an enormous, frankly, uh, reduction in emissions you put that into the context of the Kyoto Protocol, which was uh, its ambition was really only about 5% for industrialized countries uh, off of 1990. So when we're talking about 70%, 80% reduction in global emissions today, not industrialized country emissions, global emissions, that is a huge number. And uh, approximately a 70% reduction would be uh, 20 gigatons, 20 billion tons, of CO2 per year. What's a gigaton? Not a number that, that, that many of us deal with on a daily basis. Uh, a gigaton is, is roughly, and, and these numbers are changing all the time, but roughly equivalent to 20 times all the wind in the world. So all the wind power in the world and the fossil fuels that are being displaced by that wind power, multiply that by 20 and you have a gigaton. What are we trying to avoid? Well, I mean, this is a nice chart put out by the Carbon Trust just indicating that we, we, we can probably be talking about one degree, two degrees. We can talk about adaptation in those contexts. It gets a lot harder to talk about adaptation to climate change, for example, when you get up into the four, five, six degree range, um, you know, six degree abrupt runaway change. How, how do you adapt to abrupt runaway uh, change, but even long before that, four degrees, five degrees, it, it's really quite uh, hard to imagine all of the changes that, that that would infer, not to mention the changes we, we haven't even figured out yet in terms of, of black swans. So that's why at some point, you know, we can, we can talk about adaptation today, but at some point mitigation does come back in and have to play a huge role because you simply can't adapt to temperatures that are continuing to rise uh, with the increasing use of, of fossil fuels. It, it's just not practical. From a ports perspective, from a maritime perspective, this is an interesting graphic just to show you know, there are a lot of ports with, with a lot at risk. It may not be nearly the, the dollar value that, that some ports in, in New York and elsewhere have at risk from, from events like the recent uh, Superstorm Sandy, but we are talking about, about dramatic uh, proportional increases in the asset value of these ports uh, that exposed to climate change between 2005 and the 2070s. So, so there will be impacts all over the world as we start to see uh, uh, even, even the two-degree scenario uh, play out, much less some of the other scenarios that people are now talking about as uh, plausibly realistic. So you know, the, the key message for, for the shipping industry and, and, and what a lot of people have been trying to argue uh, with the IMO and its discussion of greenhouse gas and climate change issues
is that you know the shipping industry is is becoming a major player. Um, shipping over time will have to reduce its emissions, as will other uh, industries that will impose costs on shipping. One of the sort of interesting factoids here is if you talk about a, a $30, $40, $50 uh, ton of CO2 carbon fee or carbon tax, that has a big impact on the electric sector, has virtually no impact on the shipping sector in terms of, of fuel uh, decisions. So the same, to, to have the same effect in terms of reducing emissions in the maritime sector as in the electric sector, uh, you, would, you would have to have um, CO2 values uh, $200 a ton, not $30. Uh, a ton. It's just an interesting uh, factoid in terms of thinking about how this all develops within the uh, the maritime industry. The risks of of not em sort of embracing that. I mean, the the risk is that delaying action will increase shipping emissions over time, make future reduction targets more expensive. Um, I mean, clearly from an influence and politics standpoint, the shipping industry has has more opportunity to influence the process. Uh, acting earlier in the process than being dragged into the process uh, later on. And the shipping industry could, at least in principle, have, have an interesting role to play in helping countries sort out uh, sort of the, the, the potential for regional chaos where different uh, regions have different rules for, for pollution from shipping, including greenhouse gas emissions from shipping, which could just make doing business uh, a lot more difficult uh, around the world and, and coming up with some sort of common framework and s common policy and regulatory framework makes a lot of sense and the industry might be able to help with that. Uh, there, but there is opportunity too. I mean clearly the shipping industry is the most CO2 efficient way to move goods um, either you know either transocean or even inland waterways. So the shipping industry has an opportunity to capitalize on the sector's uh, natural advantage. Uh, supply chains are more and more concerned about uh, climate change and, and greenhouse gas footprints and shipping can help people, uh, suppliers and, and, and retailers concerned about that. They can help reduce those footprints. And there's the opportunity be, to be perceived as, as a leader and, uh, and not a follower. So, so he, those are just some of the considerations in terms of thinking about how the shipping industry fits uh, into the larger uh, climate change issue. And it, it's certainly not a simple issue. It, it varies a lot. One of the real complications uh, here for, for greenhouse gas policy is just the very different way that different parts of the industry uh, are organized in terms of who owns the ships, who buys the fuel, who charters the ships, who has responsibility for what. Uh, it makes it very difficult to actually come up with a, a common policy framework that makes sense across the different uh, sectors of the shipping industry. Hard to know what the timing on this ends up being, hard to know what the actual economic impact ends up being, but the message that I would, I would tend to leave with you is, is that even though we, we can't pin those things down, there's a lot of uncertainty here and there are black swans sort of flying around deciding when and where uh, to land and, and it is certainly possible that, that we could see you know, enough of an acceleration in climate change and, and enough climate change events to really tip the balance towards climate policy. And we could see some very rapid changes uh, on the policy, both, both national, regional, and international, uh, very quickly if some of these climate events start to uh, tip in the wrong direction in their own right. So it, it's an uncertain picture, but it is, it is not a picture that the shipping industry is going to be able uh, to avoid. And, and one can argue pretty convincingly that, that it does make sense for the industry to be thinking both about policy and, both, and about adaptation uh, to, the, to the developments uh, from climate change and from climate change policy. Thanks very much. Um, I do have my email address, mark.trexler at dnvkema.com.
and I'd be happy to answer any questions that uh, you send uh, my way. Thanks.